Well, one of the things we teach is there are 17 wealth or mind files that people get, you know, crossed up. And one of them is that uh, the language of the employee is they are thinking, I'm going to trade time for money. I'm going to get a paycheck. I'm going to have security. I'm going to have my 401k. I'm going to have all those, those things that make me feel safe. And so when you give somebody that package of language, they start speaking that that's what they know. The millionaire thinks differently. The millionaire earns money not to spend it, but to invest it. Mm -hmm. The millionaire earns money to get educated at a higher level, not to be entertained. So when you start to break down the habitual thought processes, they lead to different destinations. And so you and I are using a language that leads us to problem solving, growth, entrepreneurship, possibility, curiosity. And the most people that are struggling, they're just eating a different diet of words. And, you know, you can't get in shape eating only carbs and you can't get rich, you know, when you're eating a diet of an employee mindset. So that's where we take people in and we go, okay. Tell us what your inner narrative is. Tell us what words you're using to have a conversation with yourself. And then we help them reformulate that so that they now have this possibility thinking versus a probability thinking of just survival. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the US alone and more than double that across the globe. There are people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to the next episode of the Millionaire Secrets Show. So excited to be with you as always, Jeff Lerner, your host. Uh, today, I'm joined by a really wonderful human being who I actually had the chance to be on his show yesterday. So I kind of feel like we're just picking up a conversation we just left off of. His name is Rock Thomas, founder of Rock Thomas International and the M1 Mastermind. Uh, formerly a, a really, really successful real estate franchise owner, uh, multimillionaire business person, author, speaker. Um, he's studied with a lot of the greats in personal and professional development, Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra, Jack Canfield. And uh, he's also the host of the Rock Your Money, Rock Your Life podcast, which again, I was blessed to get to be on yesterday. Mr. Rock Thomas, how are you? Welcome to Millionaire Secrets. I'm doing fantastic. Feeling very blessed to be uh, having this pitch and catch conversation with you. <laughs> Amen to that. So, um, you know, one thing that I think immediately jumps out and I'm sure is, is forever associated with your brand is that just incredibly inspiring goal cast video, which is how I was first exposed to you, honestly, um, along with over a hundred million other people. So it's, it's certainly made the rounds, but I mean, what a, what a story growing up, not just, you know, it sounds like financially challenged on, on a farm in, in North or in Canada up, up North, but even just sort of almost emotionally deprived. It sounds, sounds like, um, what, what a story. I mean, do you mind, I, I, you know, the goal cast video does a wonderful job, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind retelling a bit of it here on the show. Yeah, I mean, I think that we all have our story and our journey. And I was just, you know, lucky enough to be able to articulate it in a way that a lot of people resonated with the fact that a lot of our parents did the best they could. My parents went through war and, you know, they brought their programming, they downloaded it on me. And there were parts that just didn't make me feel loved and, and supported. And so I acted out in certain ways and then I developed parts of myself that were strong, like I'm really resourceful and I can work hard, et cetera. But there was parts of me that were a little bit broken. And so I tell that story and then the rest of my life I spent patching those pieces together. And I think a lot of people could relate because, you know, we all have this fear that we're not enough. Yeah. And 
And when that's fed, you know, voraciously fed when you're growing up, you develop some complexes like, you know, I felt ugly and stupid and skinny. And, um, and when you do that, you risk falling behind because if you're stupid, you don't raise your hand to answer questions. Yeah. And if you feel ugly, you don't go out and ask girls on dates. So you start to develop more complexes until eventually you get so desperate that you break through. And so what I learned through all of those measures of breaking through, I now share with people so that they don't have to maybe wait as long as I did to have, you know, the life that I get to live now. Yeah, well said. You know, I can't remember, you, you studied uh, with Wayne Dyer as well, right? Yeah, I did study with Wayne Dyer. And I can't, I can't remember in my mind, it's toggling between, it was either Wayne Dyer or John Bradshaw. So maybe I'm misattributing this quote oh. to Wayne Dyer, but you, you, you may know John Bradshaw too. But uh, the quote is essentially that we will spend our entire adult lives trying to meet the needs that were unmet in childhood. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it sounds like that's kind of what you've done. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people, sadly, they ignore it. So they, they cover it up with enough distractions, right? So they develop these addictions of gambling or of TV or gossip, or they fall in love with their problems. I felt like, you know, my journey was to become the highest version of myself, and I'm obviously still working on it. But I think when you get into that journey of trying to uncover those pieces, then you start to get, at least I got addicted in a good way to personal development and being a better version of myself. And, and I worked my way through what I call the eight gardens of life. So got pretty good at the money game. And I started working on the investment game because I sucked at that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then I started working on, you know, the health game because my father died of cancer. So you work your way through the different areas of your life and you try to level them all up. And so, you know, the communication game is still one I'm working on because relationships, I think, are the place where you get the most, but you also risk the most. Yeah, well said. I like that. I like that analogy of the gardens of life. And I can certainly see how my own life has been uh, reflective of that. And, and, and it still is. I mean, it's still a journey. I'm still uh, meandering between the gardens, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe an interesting place to start. I mean, you mentioned these various gardens. And, you know, visually, I, I don't personally think them to be linear, but I feel like a lot of people do. There's kind of like the money garden first for a lot of people, and then the health garden, and then the communication garden, and then the, I don't know, emotional fitness garden, whatever. The, I don't know your eight gardens, but, but I know that a lot of people seem to have the money garden as like the doorway to all the gardens. Um, I'm curious. If you experience that, if you agree with that, and kind of how you feel about that now based on everything that you've been through. Yeah, great question. I think that you can trace it back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and yeah. what people need is they need food, shelter, and clothing. And if you don't have money, it's hard to have those. So saying to somebody, hey, you should work on a six pack or get the body of your life when they're wondering where they're gonna eat their next meal, it doesn't really work for them because their amygdala is working overtime to say, dude, you know, you need to get some food. So what I did was I, I was, I'm more interested in the emotions that people live in. What, you know, how do you get to gratitude? How do you get to joy? How do you get to feeling fully alive? But as much as I waved that flag, people were like, yeah, but dude, I need to pay the bills. So I shifted it. And that's why my podcast is rock your money, rock your life. Because what I'm going to do first is we're going to go into your financial garden and we're going to make it right. Now, it's not only that. I always say to people, what I'd like to do is major in that garden and minor in your health and relationship garden. So we might spend 70% on the, on, the, on the money piece to get that right rapidly, but 15% on your health and 15% on your communication, the five love languages. We work on something gently, quietly in the background while you're hammering away at freaking figuring out your money game. And we got to get you off of the conventional education of, you know, get a good education, go get a job because that's just trading time for money. So we start shifting things to passive income vehicles. What's your relationship with money? What meaning did you give it? And we walked them through their money personality types. And when we shine a light on all of that, people are like, oh, my God, holy crap, I'm not doing money properly. Mm -hmm. And when they get that shift, they buy back time. And when they buy back time, 
we now spend maybe 30% on the money and we can move into other gardens and start distributing their time to fix the weeds that are in those other gardens. I, um, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, as, a, as a, an educator who's also a pragmatist, I, I just completely align with what you said, which is, you know, I, I, I call it the three, uh, the physical, personal, and professional buckets of life. You know, I call it my three Ps and it's, it's exactly what you're saying, right? It's your money, it's your relationships, including relationship with self and, and communication driven relationships, and it's your health, your, your physical wellness. Um, but yeah, I mean, to your point, people come in and they're just like, I want to make money. Even if they're already making money, very often it's, they don't like what they're having to do to make money. And so it's, to them, it feels like just as, as big a, a problem as not having enough money. Um, but, but, you know, I also very much agree with you that it, you know, there's kind of this idea of like how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it's very unlikely that you're going to get mastery in the financial part of your life while simultaneously neglecting the other two. If, if for no other reason, the simple fact that like your body is the battery source for all of your behavior. And if your battery is running low, you're not taking care of that, you know, whether it's money or anything else, you're likely to go out and, and fall short. So, you know, that's my, that's my point of view. It sounds like we totally agree, but you mentioned getting them out of the educational rut, you know, the, the educational system that maybe has not equipped them to be successful in all these areas of your life. And that's a big, a big part of my mission is, is kind of redefining education. I'm curious to hear you share your thoughts on, on what it is that education is currently falling short of with people, kind of how did we get here to this place? And, and then I guess from there, what's your prescription? What, what do you help people do about it? Well, I, there's a school called, I think, the Acton School or something like that. And if you talk to Elon Musk, he started his own school and they have no curriculum. Mm -hmm. They work with what shows up for the child and they build on that. And I'm a much, I'm, I believe a lot, a lot more on that is stop teaching people things that they're not going to use like dinosaurs and stuff like that and, and, and the history of 1816 and all that sort of thing. You could maybe gloss across that. But I think what you what we are missing is the creativity is meeting people where they're at. And I'll give you an example. I have a guy in my tribe who he's was a CPA, 31 years old, married, picket fence, beautiful wife, got a kid. And then the kid developed an irregular heart uh, condition and they needed to watch him 24 hours a day because if something went happen, he could stop breathing. So the guy would go to work and when he would come home, his wife would then, they would pass the baton and his wife would go be a nurse and work. And then the mother-in-law would come over and, and, and 24 hours around the clock and they had no life. And so then he came into my ecosystem and we put people through a thing called sacred gifts where we help them identify what their natural tendencies is. Some people believe what God gave you. So for instance, I have the gift of encouragement. You obviously have the gift of music, right? So you had to build upon it through hours of practice but you had a predisposition to that does that make sense very much yes so then what you want to do is you you don't want to try to get you to be a carpenter necessarily or a chef you want to get you to expand where you light up and where there's a flow in your life so when he felt we put him through this we found out that he had the gift of teaching so as supplemental income, we were teaching him how to do Airbnbs. And then he discovered he loved to help everybody around him learn what he was learning. Long story short, he now has retired his mother, retired his wife, retired himself from his job, and he teaches people how to purchase and manage Airbnbs. He has hundreds of clients. He has an online program that he charges $6,000 for, and he's completely financially free. He owns 28 Airbnbs, and he's living a life that's free, joyful, and he's lit up. So what's wrong with the education system? I think it kind of summed it up in that story. Does that make sense? It very much does. And I will mention as an aside that I would love to have your friend's information because uh, sort of non-traditional real estate strategies are a big part of what we're wanting to expand into with my, my education company, Entra. So make a note, maybe shoot that over if you're comfortable with it. Of course. Um, but yeah, so, so it's true, you know, education does, you know, they're burdened with the responsibility to somehow 
educate millions and millions of students, right? And, you know, from an, eco an economy of scale perspective, I guess it makes sense why they go, okay, we need to create a one size fits all approach to this. You know, we cannot do customized and personalized educational paths for right. uh, you know, whatever, a, an incoming freshman class at the high school level of 1,700 students every year. Right. Because frankly, teachers aren't paid enough to give that kind of attention. There aren't enough of them. And, and the system, you know, so, so, and, and so on and so forth, right? I guess the, ob the, the reasons kind of speak for themselves and kind of obvious, but do you believe that there's something that could be done about it at a systemic level? I mean, you know, if you can afford to go to Elon Musk's private school, good on you. But, but for the broad, <laughs> broader world, is there, is there a way we can fix it? Or is it, is it about telling everyone, okay, look, you went through school, same as me. It is what it is. Now it's your responsibility to clean up some of the mess. Well, I think it's maybe both because the system is kind of like the Senate. It's really hard to change. <laughs> but I would also say this is that I learned this from Tony Robbins and I do that in my business. I've been running a mastermind for eight years and we are voracious when it comes to feedback. So we're constantly asking the community, what are you applying? What tools did you use? If I have a buffet of 50 tools that I give my, my members and they're only using 17 of them, we're gonna chop off definitely the 10 worst tools or least used tools and we're gonna look for tools that are more appropriate for what's happening in a changing economy. And I think they're lacking that in the school system is look at the, the least used course, mm -hmm. change the curriculum, put the teachers together in a mastermind organization and say of everything you're teaching, what part of the curriculum could we eliminate and what should we add? And maybe they're doing that on some level, but I think they could accelerate that so that now maybe they need to be having a component of, of uh, social media. I remember listening to a book and this girl says, um, she goes, you know, she's talking about relationships and she goes, you know, I, I spent a few weeks learning about dinosaurs and two, and two weeks learning about, um, about sex ed. And she goes, I don't know about you, but I haven't met any dinosaurs, but I've met a lot of dicks in my life. And it would have been good to have more information on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well said, like, like brilliantly said. And, you know, not to mention that no time is given to how to get a bank loan, how to, yeah. how to manage your credit, how yeah. to protect your identity, how to uh, rally a team and, and communicate in a way that inspires people to want to work with you and your vision so that you can grow a business, like how to sell. I mean, there's not a single course in all of high school and even college, unless you get very narrowly specialized, on sales. Right, right. That's sales, take away all selling in the world. Nobody has a job. There's no velocity of money. Everything right. ends immediately. And yet we never talk about it. It's crazy to me. Agreed. And so people like you and I choose to take on the role of being what I call the street smart millionaire that is going to teach the young mind how to become a problem solver. And that's what entrepreneurs are, is they're just problem solvers. And they keep on tweaking and test, you know, um, split testing things online, but you also split test things in the real uh, world. And then you find out what works and you adapt and you continue to provide that product. So I think that that's um, where you and I come in is we're like, hey, once you get your formal education, your real education is going to start. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true. So I'm curious. I mean, we don't have to talk about education this entire show, but you, you seem to have a lot of astute things to say about it. So forgive me for, for camping here for a moment. <laughs> um, you know, do you, I, I got to think, and maybe I'm going to alienate some of my audience that are teachers, but I, I got to think that one of the fundamental challenges here is that, you know, teachers are to some degree rinse, wash, and repeat bureaucrats in terms of mm -hmm. the mechanics of what they do. Now, the energy of what they do can have a lot of love and nurturing, and those are the things that make great teachers, but the actual mechanics of it are just very prescripted and, and, and almost automaton like, you know, the reality, I, I suspect, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I can speak for myself. There's not a, a, a chance in a snowball's chance in hell that I would take a job as a high school teacher. Yeah. I don't, I don't accept the pay. I don't accept the working conditions. I don't accept the, the constrictions. I doubt you would either. 
is there a way to fix this without kind of changing the whole concept of what it means to be a teacher and ultimately attracting a, a different group of people to do that job? Well, you know, I, I always wondered why teachers got paid so little and, and athletes got paid so much, but it business is business. But if you, if somehow, you know, there could be a little tax on an athlete who's making $30 million a year to throw a baseball, which God bless them, you know, they're great at that. I just think it's out of proportion and take a little bit of that and pay somebody a little bit more so you can attract better talent as teachers and they could be part of the growth process. But I don't see that happening. And so I think it's on parents now and it's on us entrepreneurs to provide the education. And you know what the beauty of, of COVID is that now there's this opportunity for us all to give uh, direct education to people all over the planet. I have people from all over the planet in my mastermind group. And this morning I had a 15 year old girl interview me on her little school podcast and she goes, I've been following you for a while and I think you're a real inspiration. And, and I said to her, you know, you're not too young to join my mastermind, even though it's helping mostly adults become millionaires. And she goes, really? I said, yeah, talk to your dad about it. And, you know, we have a special place for kids under 18. So I think it's going to shift. Yeah. And, and I get the same sense. I mean, when I, when I comb through my Instagram DMs, um, and really, you know, I feel like Instagram is the platform that has kind of an equal distribution of old and young. I mean, Facebook is weighted old. Snapchat yeah. is weighted young. Instagram gives you, I think, a very broad cross section. I look at my Instagram DMs. It is disproportionately teenagers and even sometimes middle schoolers saying like, I, I want to help my parents or I have a different vision for my life or I'm bored as hell at school. Like, I want to go a different direction. Is there anything you can do for me? So again, to, to your point about feedback, I actually think if the schools would just listen to the kids, they would understand how far off course they really are because, because those kids, they're not telling the schools because there's no place to tell them. Instead, they're telling you and me. Yeah. Like, help, help. This isn't, this isn't working. I don't see how this solves a problem in my life. Um, well, I, think, I think also 10 years from now, meat is probably going to be what smoking is now is, you know, we're starting to get an education around what are better choices. And um, I'm a plant-based consumer. I still will eat occasionally a little bit of fish and chicken or meat, mm -hmm. but I've moved away from that based on education and based on exposure to people that are getting better results. Tom Brady, Djokovic, um, a lot of these top people are plant-based eaters, Tony Robbins. Yeah. And, you know, they're doing pretty good. Last time I checked, gorillas don't eat meat apparently they have a little bit of muscle so everything we've been sold on you know you got to eat that to have the protein blah 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 it's all bullshit in my opinion it's all marketing the right. same way back in the day remember the milk mustache you had to have um oh don't even get me started on dairy but right exactly oh. <laughs> so, so i think the world is starting to and COVID has disrupted mother nature's a little pissed off so I think we're in some interesting times. I think people are becoming more open to going back to some of the things that were more traditional. And I think it's exciting times. Yeah, I, I read an article about a, a scientist that did some sort of a, I don't know, muscular capacity test. Who knows how he did it exactly, but they basically tested a gorilla's pecs and figured out that your average gorilla in the wild can bench about 1,400 pounds. Wow. And uh, that's, an, that's and, and you think about it, they don't work out. Imagine if you could like train a gorilla. I mean, you take the average untrained human who can maybe bench 150 pounds and you train them really well, they can maybe double that. Right. If we, if we did that to a gorilla, he could maybe bench two, 3,000 pounds. And like you say, he lives off of plants. Yeah, so I'm excited about what that means. And I, you know, I grow vegetables in my back garden and I juice every day and I, you know, I, I do things that work for my body. I'm not saying that that works for everybody. Pay attention to what works for you, but be aware. Don't just listen to, you know, what the news is saying and just think logically, in my opinion, if you can't pronounce, you know, or spell the product on the box, mm -hmm. there's a chance you probably don't need it. So just, you know, I think common sense. How long have you been plant-based? I mean, it's in degrees. The last year and a half, I've, I've gone almost like 99%. Uh, but since 20, 20 years ago when I met Tony Robbins is when I shifted to probably 70%. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's kind of gone 70, 75, 80, 85. And now I'm around 95. Well, again, another item to put on the list of things I would love to chat with you about off the show, because I don't want our whole show to be about plant-based dieting, but I have a ton of questions uh, about your experience with that. I, I saw the movie Game Changers, which I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with and have, have shifted somewhat in that direction, but I would, I would say I'm maybe only at 40 or 50%. So okay. I still have lots to learn, but um, let's, let's kind of sh shift gears because I'm <laughs> kind of like with what we said earlier, a lot of people listen to your show. I mean, and my show is called Millionaire Secrets. Let's not be coy about why people listen. Um, they want to make money. So, so let's kind of veer into Rock Thomas leaves the farm at some age and somehow ends up as, as a wildly successful multi, you know, residential, multi franchise owner of residential real estate businesses. Um, was that kind of your first shift where you really, you know, struck gold, so to speak? So my journey was on the farm. I learned how to work hard and I was brainwashed a lot that life would be hard. So when I left at 17, I, I got jobs like, working in McDonald's, uh, doing landscaping, working at the bar at nighttime, uh, working as a waiter, a busboy. So I usually had two or three jobs or a side business or hustle, or I knocked on doors and sold things, or I did telephone, telemarketing. I basically, I did a lot of, I did just virtually every MLM you could in the world and failed at most of them. But I was a working machine and I, yeah. by the time I, was in my late 20s i had i was the owner of a senior citizen home um i bet i bought it 25 i bought a house and i turned it into a senior citizen home i was making one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year running that and i was making twenty five thousand dollars a year as a flight attendant um, just to give you an idea of wow. where the money was being made so i had an entrepreneurial spirit but it was all based on really mechanical hard work yeah and then when in my late 20s, I got introduced to real estate, that's when my whole life opened up. You talked about sales before. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, sales, you can make as much money as you want if you're willing to get skilled and you're willing to be systematized. So I studied voraciously and within four years, I went from one sale in real estate to 100 sales a year. The average agent in my office was making six sales a year. I was making a hundred. I believe it. I was crushing it. I was systematized. I had follow up. I had rapport. I, I dropped off forget me not flowers door to door. I had calendars. I, w I was at the church. I was doing fundraisers for the schools. I was just all in, and therefore I was the go-to guy. Then I bought the company I was working for. But the key factor to the success came in that I had a mentor. And I had a mentor who was really good at what he did, Jeff. And he just said to me, if you're willing to just trust me for six months, just do exactly what I say, you're going to shorten the curve rapidly. And I said, I'm in. And so I didn't question what he taught me or what he told me. I just did it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a big thing is people are always looking for these shortcuts. So you have a mentor that says, hey, do this, do that. And they're like, well, I could tweak it this way and I could do half of it if I did. And they mess with the formula. There's a recipe to bake a cake. And you're like, yeah, you know what? I think I'll put in a little bit more sugar because I like it sweet. No, there's a reason that you put a pinch of salt in a cake, even though you think it doesn't make sense. So I think that was a difference for me is I was very coachable and I had a good work ethic. And when you combine those two, I say to people, if you want to be successful, come to me with passionate curiosity and a work ethic, and I'll turn you into a millionaire, guaranteed. I, I, I honestly, dare I say, I think I would make the same guarantee. Like if you'll come to me, a completely open book, who's ready to work at a top 1% level, I actually think, I mean, the FTC wouldn't let me put this in writing, but like I literally could guarantee you'll make a million dollars. It's, right, it's exactly. It's so true. And, and, and in particular, you know, I, I teach a lot of people more of the online marketing right. side of things. Although, although, you know, we use online marketing to help people grow all kinds of businesses. But, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, hey, I, I just want to make money online. I don't even know what that means, but I know I want to do it. Um, and I would, I would liken it very much to residential real estate. And you were on the residential side, right? Yes. Okay, listing homes and such. 
I, I have a buddy in Dallas who's one of the fastest growing residential real estate uh, team leaders down there. And he kind of says the same thing. It's like, these are two worlds, online, you know, digital marketing and real estate, where like anybody with a basic set of, of abilities, and I mean like basic, like walking, talking, um, you know, the ability to groom themselves at a reasonable level, like, you know, it doesn't take much, um, can, can literally be wildly successful. And yet they are almost uniquely among all industries, the two that have some of the lowest success rates, digital marketing and real estate. And I assume some of that is because there's, you know, at least perceptually a low barrier to entry. So it's like just millions of people flood into it. True. But, but there is something else too that I think you alluded to, which is like things that are that formulaic, but that also take the consistency and the repetition and the compounding value of, of, what some people, I guess, consider a long period of time, like, hey, do this every day for two years. You know, to you or me, we're like, well, shoot, as long as, it's, as, long as it works, I'm totally willing to do that. But to a lot of people, they're like, I, I can't do that. I, I, need it. I need it in 30 days. Um, maybe you can speak to your experience, because I assume as a real estate franchise owner, I know you had, I think, six, six franchises at one point. You probably cycled a lot of people in and out that weren't willing to do the process. Um, why? Why are people so much their own enemies in that regard? Yeah, so beautiful. I, I love the way you communicate. Um, I, there's a couple of things. I interviewed a guy named Chris Rouse who held an Olympic athlete for an Olympic backstroke swimming record for nine years. Hmm. And it was echoed with um, the book Atomic Habits. And what they talk about is the book. fact that Successful. The difference between the Michael Jordans and, and the Roger Federer's is that they found a way to fall in love with repetition. They understand that the monotony of doing the same stroke over and over again leads to an unconscious nuance that gives them the edge. The average person, when you tell them two years, first of all, they're usually so out of whack that they need to eat tomorrow. They have to hunt. They can't, they can't farm. Yeah. Two-year program is a farming program. There's a cycle of planting a seed, nurturing it, fertilizing it, taking care of it, and harvesting it later. I'm very good at doing that. I think long-term. I learned to think long-term maybe because I grew up on a farm. And I understood that you didn't plant the seed and get the tomato tomorrow. You had to think three, four months in advance if you wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. Most people don't think that way. So if you fall in love with repetition, you understand the cycle of time, and you understand the power of compounding, that is, you do 20 calls every day, no matter what, then eventually it'll lead to a lead that you can put into your funnel and you systematize it through technology. Now you have a business that's worth owning. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of monotony in that. There's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of things that don't pay right away. So you have to constantly go back to your vision and go, yes, if I, if I create this YouTube you know, channel, and I get it up to 4,000 hours of views, which will take me a year, and I create all this content, which at the beginning it's gonna suck and be terrible, and I will suck and be terrible, but a year from now, I'll be making $100,000 off of commercials. That's really cool. Most people can't run that race. Yeah. And that's why 97% of people are not millionaires in North America, and they're all living paycheck to paycheck, working for people like you and me. You know, I love that you brought up a YouTube channel, and and not to toot my horn because frankly, I'm not particularly impressed with my own results. I still have a so far to go, but I will state as an illustration of what you just said, uh, this, this episode, this conversation is going to appear on my YouTube channel among other places. I started it a little over two years ago. And like you said, man, I started with a video that's, you know, makes it's super cringeworthy now. <laughs> and, and it, you know, I don't remember. You, you got 100 million views on your Goldcast video. I, uh, I think I might have gotten 100 views in two years on my first video. So, um, you know, it shows how, how far you can go. But I've just been doing it. I mean, I'd say three to five videos a week for yeah. over two years. I haven't, missed, I haven't missed a week, haven't missed a beat. And now I'm growing uh, between 150 and 200 subscribers a day. And I make about between four and five, this month will be between four and $5,000 in, in shared ad revenue from YouTube, which is totally independent of the fact that the videos 
pull people into my funnels and I have a much more sophisticated business than that. But literally, probably one more year, I could retire, functionally retire at a six figure income level because I made three to five YouTube videos a week for three years. Yeah. But, exactly. but the first year, it was like, I made $62 this month. The next month I made $67. The next month I made $74. It was like, like it would be disrespecting paint for me to say it was like watching paint dry. <laughs> and, and yet now people are like, oh, you have this fast growing YouTube channel and da, da, da. It's just, it's exactly what you said, man. It's just the repetitions, but it's not mind, and it's the same way when I used to play the piano. It's not mindlessly executing the repetitions. It's, it's rep, executing the repetitions at a high level of consciousness where every repetition you say, how can it be a tiny bit better than the last repetition? I'm with you, man. Well said. I agree 100%. It is this process I call, I've coined it CSI. I think Tony calls it can I. For me, it's creative suggestions for improvement. It's that every time I do a process or I do a video and I can tell you, I have a white sheet and every time we do a recording for YouTube, we write down, what did we think we did well? What could we improve? And then, you know, it's like, when I do it, we need a bottle of water. We always set up a bottle of water for me and the cameraman because sometimes my voice gets dry. So yeah. boom, we learned that. So that's part of the process. We do our checklist and we go in. So we limit the number of errors that we make. We get a tiny, tiny bit better, a little bit more efficient. And over time, we stand out from the crowd because we were committed to our craft. Yeah, and, and to that, I have to, for those seeing, watching on YouTube, you'll see, I, for exactly the same reasons, I have my half gallon bottle of ionized water with me at all times during interviews and, and anything where I have to talk for any length of time. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think there's sort of a mathematical silliness to a lot of people's thinking. And, and my, my query here isn't to like, mock or deride people. It's to say, hey, if we can unravel the silliness and people can look themselves in the mirror and say, why do I have that silliness? Then they can hopefully get to a deeper answer that allows them to dis discard the silliness. And here's what I mean. Like, I'll use my YouTube as an example, and, and I don't know your process, but I mean, I figure the average YouTube video takes me an hour to create. Mm -hmm. Maybe 30 minutes of research and prep and 15 to 30 minutes of delivery, right? And then, you know, at this point, I have a team that takes it and makes it look uh, more, more produced. But when I started, I didn't. When I started, I took the raw video, I put it into Camtasia, I added a bumper, I sent, I sent, the, uh, sent it off to rev.com, got the transcription, brought it back in, loaded it myself. Let's say when I started, it took me four hours to create. Mm -hmm. So three to, three to five of those videos a week, and by the way, I don't think you need to do three to five. Let's, I think realistically you need to do two to kind of get momentum on a YouTube channel. So now that would take me two hours a week. When I started, it would take me eight. Either way, it's a very doable thing. And you say to someone, okay, it's gonna take you, let's say anywhere from two to eight hours a week. You're gonna need to do it consistently for three years. By the way, it's not just gonna uh, require that you do the work. But in order to keep producing valuable content and having meaningful things to say, it's also going to level you up in terms of your input, the reading that you do, the information that you process, the media that you consume to find inspiration. And, and, and just, you know, it's going to challenge you in really awesome ways, in, in many ways. And that's it. Do that for three years and you'll have a semi-passive income of $100,000 a year that you can nurture for the rest of your life. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal. And by the way, I assume it's the same in real estate. It's like, hey, I need you to make these calls for an hour a day. I need you to write thank you notes for 30 minutes a day. I need you to beat the streets for two hours a day, right? And so, so the time to value relationship with the things that we're talking about is so much better than the time to value relationship of most jobs. Yeah. But people will do the job all day long and they will kick and scream about what we're talking about. Why? Why the mathematical silliness? Well, one of the things we teach is there are 17 wealth or mind files that people get, you know, crossed up. And one of them is that 
uh, the language of the employee is they are thinking, I'm going to trade time for money. I'm going to get a paycheck. I'm going to have security. I'm going to have my 401k. I'm going to have all those, those things that make me feel safe. And so when you give somebody that package of language, they start speaking that that's what they know. The millionaire thinks differently. The millionaire earns money not to spend it, but to invest it. Mm -hmm. The millionaire earns money to get educated at a higher level, not to be entertained. So when you start to break down the habitual thought processes, they lead to different destinations. And so you and I are using a language that leads us to problem solving, growth, entrepreneurship, possibility, curiosity. And the most people that are struggling, they're just eating a different diet of words. And, you know, you can't get in shape eating only carbs and you can't get rich, you know, when you're eating a diet of an employee mindset. So that's where we take people in and we go, OK. Tell us what your inner narrative is. Tell us what words you're using to have a conversation with yourself. And then we help them reformulate that so that they now have this possibility thinking versus a probability thinking of just survival. I'm so grateful you just said that. Like one of the value, in fact, I have it on my wall here. Uh, my, my original core beliefs document has, we favor possibility over probability. Whoa, dude, look at that. Nailed it. I'm so grateful you said that. Um, it, it, and here's the thing. I, I actually think, I mean, it's, it's interesting we're talking probabilities because if you ask people what they want out of life, and I guess depending on how beaten down they, they've become, you know, the, the, I would say the, the average to above average person, the person who's not just totally smashed down, will say some pretty big things that they want out of life, right? Like, I want to... I want to take a trip someday. I want to retire. I want to be able to take care of my, my kids and my grandkids. I want to start an orphanage in Calcutta or like whatever, right? Is Calcutta even still the name of that city? I think it's, no, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's still Calcutta. <laughs> Sorry, I, I get distracted. But, and yet you say, okay, well, here are the things you say you want out of life. So probability wise is, is the, the employment path uh, more or less probable to get you to your desired outcome than the entrepreneurship path. I would argue that for most people, the employment path is a much lower probability way of having their dreams come true. Oh, hundred percent. But here's the thing that, that, you know, I teach is increase your earn, decrease your burn. And the way you do that is that at any given point in time, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's become wildly successful that worked 35 to 40 hours a week forever. Anybody I know, at least for a three to five year period, you know, burned the candle at both ends and they work yeah. 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And here's the benefit is imagine you have a job that makes you 50 grand a year and you work 40 hours a week or 30 grand, whatever it is. And you spend approximately all that money to live because that's what people do. Right. Now, add a second side hustle or a second job. And I've done the math on this, is 168 hours in a week, sleep eight hours a day, you have 112 hours left, give you 30 hours to brush your teeth and, and, and you know, take a shower and all that sort of stuff, work out a little bit, you still got 80 hours left. Yeah. So you could do two jobs. So you do your one job at 30,000 or 50,000, whatever it is, you spend all that money to live, and you take your second job and you invest all that money. Now, if you're working 80 hours a week, guess what? you have less time to spend money. Yeah. So the 30,000 you were spending before on entertainment and going out, you're actually gonna save more money. So you're gonna, let's say you made 30 and you make another 30 in your second job, you know, of 60, you were spending 30, you'll probably spend 20. So now you have 40,000 to invest. You take that 40,000 and you start buying some real estate or you do some good things with it, you are gonna rapidly now add a player to your scoring team. If you're LeBron James and you're the only person that can score financial points for your household and you need to take a break on the bench or you're injured, you're screwed. Yeah. So what we do is we go be your LeBron James and do double time, but now take the leftover money and add another player to your team called you know, an online e-commerce, sell some product on the side, have, have a piece of real estate, a rental property. Now you got two or three different players on the team scoring while you're sleeping, resting and relaxing. Within three to five years, 
you've got the passive income of the YouTube channel mm -hmm. that will be making you money while you sleep. And it's a complete game changer. So I say take the last five years of your working life, bring them forward and put them into these five years here and double down or double up mm -hmm. and change your life forever. You know, first of all, I, I want to say I love that concept of saying, okay, you're right now you're on a track to work for the next 30 years. So why don't we just take the last five years and pair it up with the current five years and let's right. just work, let's work both five year stretches concurrently yes. because you're young enough and you've got the energy to do it. Yes. And then by the way, it's not going to just shave off those five years. It'll probably shave off like 20 of them. Yes. That's, that's, brilliant. I love that. I really do. Uh, and by the way, I'm stealing like all this stuff. This is just so good. I wrote down, increase your earn, decrease your burn. Like consider yourself flattered via my imitation. That's, that's, that's tremendous stuff. But um, the other thing is, I really think it's, there's kind of a chicken and the egg uh, counterintuitive aspect to this. And it's, I would say it's true specifically of working out and starting a side hustle. Those are two things that people say, I should do it, but I don't have the time. And my argument would be, the reason you don't have the time is, in, and I don't think anybody's um, immune to what I'm about to say. Obviously, it's to varying degrees. But if you do a ruthless analysis of your life and your schedule, you're going to find at least some windows of time in which you're compensating or medicating for your lack of fulfillment. 100%. Whether it's your, your bowling league or your poker night or your shopping on Saturdays or your weekly, you know, ice cream indulgence, or there's going to be some little things that are like, they're actually not about need. They're about dopamine. And the need for the dopamine is because there's some pit of unfulfilledness in your life. So actually, if you just do the, it only takes like three weeks to, to change a habit or whatever the data is, or I guess Ty Lopez said it's 67 days. But if you'll just grin and bear it for those 67 days, say, you know what, I'm going to substitute my dopamine compensation for the extra effort in whatever time I can, you know, free up in that substitution, eventually you'll get to where like, you don't actually need the other thing anymore and you realize the time was there all along. Yeah, I agree again. I feel like we're, we're saying the same thing in different, <laughs> different ways. I wanna like almost disagree with you just for the fun of it. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I say sometimes people ask me when I, I go golfing or something, they go, what do you do? Sometimes just for the humor of it, I say I'm a drug dealer. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Like I'm an international drug dealer. I, you know, the drugs that I specialize in are dopamine, norepinephrine, yeah. uh, serotonin, but I manufacture, I help you manufacture them in a natural way by living life alive, by going for your dreams, by being comfortable with being uncomfortable, by building things, by giving things. And when you do that, then you don't need those, those distractions and those addictions at the same high level in order to medicate yourself to feel good. So the more you can be intentional, purposeful about your life and make a difference, the high, the naturaler you have a high and then you can live and you can build things. And that's exciting for people, but most people, A, they don't have the strategy, B, they're not surrounded by a passionate person that is going to shift their focus to a place of possibility. So they're like, oh, they just fall into survival, survival, survival. And then after a while, they're freaking numb and they're half asleep. And waking them up usually only happens when they hit rock bottom. Something stupid happens, like they get diabetes or the IRS is calling them and they have to finally get on the phone and get off their ass. So it's a process. And that's why, again, so few people are really healthy and wealthy because it's easier to take a pill than to get your ass in the gym. Yeah, I... I, I completely concur. I'll share with you something really cool that I heard yesterday. You know, I swear, if somebody wants to have a lot to say, just start interviewing people and steal all their best stuff. Yeah. I interviewed uh, David Meltzer yesterday, who you oh, yeah, like love him. Through with, and he dropped an acronym that was just so good. He said, you got to get your dose. Somehow or other, you're going to get your dose. And that means D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and other endorphins. And I was like, there you That's go. good. That's good. Oh. I'm taking that too. Um, but, but so to your point, you, you know, you talked about finding a passionate person. That was something that really stood out in what you just said. Like, 
all the tactics, all the strategies, all the intellectual, you know, uh, figuring of what to do, how to do. There's some sort of intangible, and I would argue, uh, you know, essential component to this, which is just getting fired up, right? Like enthusiasm and passion. And, and yet, man, it's in short supply. Yeah. And, and in fact, I would say that it, from a young age, it's actually, um, you know, like the most enthusiastic guy in the high school is probably the guy who gets teased the most. Yeah, you know, thank you for saying that. So check it out. If you're depressed and you're down and you're frustrated, you're kind of normal, right? You're having a bad day and people are like, hey, buddy, it's going to be okay, man. I feel badly for you. If you're walking around and you're like euphoric, people are like, that person's crazy, man. They must be on drugs. Yeah, he's, he's we're not rewarded. He's in a manic state right now. Yeah, we're not rewarded for being exceptionally enthusiastic or happy. We are actually discouraged because we make other people feel less than, so they pull us back like the crabs in the bucket. So that's that's a cultural, societal thing, and that's why another reason why I created my tribe. And we have a T-shirt that we give people when they join. It says, "We don't, you don't, we don't apologize for being awesome." Nice. Ugh. You know, you come into our tribe and have to go, well, you know what? Uh, My son uh, scored the winning goal on the weekend. I made 20,000 on the market and I made love three times this weekend and feel bad about it. You say that and the other person goes, no way. Three times? That's cool. Tell me how you did it. Yeah. (laughs) That's the one one they hone in on too, right? (laughs) I don't don't care about your son. I want to know that three times. (laughs) Um, But no, I, I, and actually, I mean, Rock, it is, it is kind of like uncanny at this point, it, it, to your point. It's like, it'd be nice if we could find something to disagree on. Um, when I started Entra, what, what's now Entra Institute, it, it started as really just a, a content creation blitz online of me putting out videos and you know, guidance based on my experiences. And my initial name for it was called School of Awesome. And I had a logo made up and I even bought the domain. I think I paid like three grand for like schoolofawesome.com, which I, I don't even use anymore. But, but yeah, I love that idea of like, we don't apologize for the fact that our life is awesome. That's, that's powerful. You know, I'm curious, do you do any, any like daily or nightly journaling? Cause that's something I've started recently and it has been a game changer. Of course. I, in fact, my third book is called the three in one planner. Mm-hmm. And it is your agenda because I like to write still. I have a Google calendar, but I still like to write. And then I have a goal setting device in it. So all the, the major goals of my life, the eight gardens and the finances and things like that. And then I have places to journal for every day. And it, I carry it with me all the time. Uh, I have it right here. You probably won't see it because of the, the, the screen. Well, you can see yeah. it. Well. No, it's, it's, it's disappearing it right. in that weird right. Zoom way. I journal every night and I, I have my favorite questions. They rotate, but they're things like, you know, what made me laugh today? Uh, nice. What am I grateful for? Where did I make a, a, con- a contribution? Who did I compliment? And I just rotate around things that are going to bring the best out of me so that the next day I'm thinking, well, you know what? I complimented that person and who am I going to compliment tomorrow? And what, how am I going to show up and how am I going to grow in that way? Where am I going to be curious? What quality questions did I ask throughout the day, et cetera? So yeah, I love journaling. It's, it's a big part. I call it auditing my day. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. We, we recently inside of Entra, as part of our internal culture and also what we're teaching to our students, but you know, kind of uh, wanting to eat our own cooking. Internally now, we submit end of day journals um, to each other, each of the team, like our content team, our, our leadership team. We share with each other, like here's everything I did today. Here were my wins. Here were my challenges. Here's my goal for tomorrow. Um, and even here are the physical, personal, and professional deposits that I made today in those accounts. And it has been, it has been such a game changer um, for us. And so, you know, Rock, as I, as I predicted what happened before we hit record, we're out of time. And yet we're in such flow. I feel like we could and, and maybe even should keep going for, for longer. But we might just have to uh, adjourn for a, a part two at some point. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. And I'm going to, you're going to send me your address. I'm going to send you one of these journals because I want your yes. feedback on it, seeing as you're, you're journaling. And uh, I think, you know, we just met yesterday, but <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got a bromance. And um, right. I, look, I look forward to this relationship growing. 
Yeah, I, I only have room in my life for one romance, but I'm open to multiple bromances. So <laughs> <laughs> that, I thought that might sounds be. great. I, um, how can the world go get further into your world and, and learn more from you? RockThomas.com is the easiest way. There's a bunch of stuff there. Uh, of course, my YouTube channel, Rock Thomas. Uh, like you, we're, we've got a lot of free information and help people, you know, journey toward becoming whole life millionaires. That's my my passion and purpose. And of course, uh, my um, my uh, podcast, Rock Your Money, Rock Your Life, where I interview cool people like you, and they can pick up a bunch of nuggets there as well. So, and then all social media, um, pretty easy to find. Cool, cool. Yeah. Well, I've I've recently become a, a follower of various social uh, platforms of yours and, and your YouTube channel as well. And and I'm I'm even catching up on a couple podcast episodes. And I can I can vouch that there's just so much value uh, waiting to be consumed for anyone in my audience. Definitely go uh, connect with Rock. I will mention we set up a landing page specifically for this episode. I mentioned this on your show yesterday as well. If somebody wants to go to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Rock T. Uh, you can get our free book. You can subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel as well. Um, Rock, this has just been as epic as predicted, man. I'm so grateful that you are here on uh, Millionaire Secrets Show, and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I I heard a few words that I haven't heard in a long time today come out of your mouth, and uh, I love I love the banter and the intellect. So thank you for being so um, passionate about being intelligently entrepreneurial. I appreciate that. I, that I, I take that very highly from you. I really appreciate it. Um, so let me, let me adjourn and to all the Millionaire Secrets watchers and listeners out there, so much gratitude. You're a blessing. You're the reason I get to do this fun stuff and call it work. And you're the best part of the show and why we do what we do. So thank you to you. Thank you, Rock. We'll see everyone on the next episode. Take care. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.